please uh, refrain from uh, recording or uh, taking pictures of the slides. Uh, the presentation and corresponding slides are copyrighted by Robson Forensic and may not be recorded, copied, distributed, or otherwise used without authorization. So having uh, satisfied my obligation to, to read that, um, we do often make these presentations available for streaming on our website after the fact. And if, if you find what we've shown here today to be valuable and you'd like a similar presentation for your law firm, insurance company, or for your legal organization, let us know and we can often accommodate those requests as well. So the program that we're all here for today is Line of Sight Studies. And Marcus Mazza, who heads our technical services group, has been gracious enough to prepare these slides and take the time to be with us here today. Um, Marcus, I, I see that your camera is on and your microphone is unmuted. Can you tell us all a little bit about your background, the types of forensic cases you've traditionally been involved in, and then also a little bit about your role here as the technical services manager? Yeah, absolutely, Jesse. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so as Jesse said, I'm the uh, head of technical services here at Robson. Uh, prior to this role, uh, I was a testifying expert here. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer. I have about 20 years experience. Uh, my background's in crash reconstruction and vehicle engineering. I uh, started my career at Daimler Chrysler um, and then ended before starting here at Robson at the Department of Defense down at the Aberdeen Proving Ground. Uh, a lot of the types of cases I was involved in, uh, obviously crash reconstruction and automotive engineering type cases. Uh, a lot of that uh, turned into the ADAS or Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. Uh, I also get involved in uh, rollover protection and side-by-sides or UTVs and uh, also own my own uh, repair shop or facility at one point. So I do a lot of our automotive repair claim cases as well. Um, so with that, um, let me move on to the next slide, please, Jesse. Of course. Um, so, you know, the outcome of a lot of cases hinges on whether or not something could be seen. There's a lot of different types of cases, uh, traffic or crash cases, uh, abduction cases, uh, assailant cases. I mean, it's virtually an endless list of the types of cases that can benefit from one of these studies. Um, and, and, but it's important to understand what is a line of sight study. So specifically, um, the line of sight study is what is used to determine whether or not something was visible along a straight line, basically a, an un, unobstructed view. So the line of sight study itself does not determine whether or not an object was discernible uh, but it does determine whether or not there's an unobstructed view of the object. Many times this might answer the overall question. Uh, other times this might only be the first step in the analysis in order to determine if something was discernible. Other factors that may come into play, distance from the object, lighting, uh, and other human factors may come into play in determining whether or not the object was actually discernible. Uh, but either way, generally the line of sight study is the first step and again, sometimes maybe the only step required in a case. Next slide, please, Justin. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, we talked, I mean, there's obviously uh, endless types of cases where these studies are, are valuable. Uh, my background is mostly in vehicle crashes. And quite frankly, a lot of these studies are generally applied to uh, vehicle crashes. Uh, and some of those the crash types that we see are intersection crashes. Uh, a lot of time motorcycle or pedestrian crashes or bicycles and scooters where we're dealing with a smaller object uh, that, that may be more difficult for a driver to see. Uh, overgrown or improperly placed vegetation or signage and, and snow piles. So uh, I have a couple of case studies prepared. Uh, one will look actually at a pedestrian crash within a parking lot and a second case that deals with a, an, another pedestrian uh, strike in the parking lot, but one dealing with snow piles. Uh, so we'll get into those a little later and, and see exactly how we tackle those and, and what kind of things that we can, uh, what kind of value we can add to the case by doing these studies. Uh, in general, uh, most of these studies can be realized in 2D, uh, basically a plan view or a top view of the site. Um, it's very rare where we have to get into a 3D view in order to uh, complete these line of sight studies and, and, and get the information that's required. Um, and again, uh, in addition to just the line of sight study, we do need a reconstruction in place. Uh, so in order to do the line of sight study, we obviously need to know where are the objects, where is the viewer, 
uh, at, at different points in time. And, and, and in order to determine that, a reconstruction needs to be done. That oftentimes is a separate expert, but something that, that may be part of the same analysis as well. Uh, next slide, please, Jesse. Um, so in addition to the reconstruction uh, that we just talked about, which again, places the objects and, and the viewer at various points in time, uh, we also need accurate geometry of the site and the objects in question. Uh, there, there are a lot of sources for this information. Um, a short list here that it includes, but not limited to uh, Google Earth and other satellite photo sources. Uh, we find Google Earth to be a, a great resource. Oftentimes the site may have changed. There may be modifications made after the incident. Uh, and using Google Earth, oftentimes we can use historical imagery and, and see what the, what the uh, location or the site uh, conditions were at the time of the incident and, and make sure that we're not, uh, we're not seeing changes that may have been made afterwards. Uh, aerial photography is another great, uh, a great source of data, including uh, drone aerial photography. Uh, we here at Robson do have our own drone. We do do aerial photography and site surveys using that type of equipment. Um, in addition, we also have a laser or multiple laser scanners and uh, total stations that we can use for doing site surveys. And then, of course, oftentimes we're also provided with engineering blueprints. Uh, these could be construction blueprints. These could be blueprints of a vehicle. Um, so again, all of these are great sources of information that we rely upon. Uh, and of course, you know, the more sources we have uh, that are consistent, you know, the more reliable and the more confident we're going to be uh, in our layout and in our study. So with that, um, I guess we'll jump right into case study number one. Uh, in this case, uh, we were a uh, plaintiff. Uh, the expert was retained by counsel and approached me to do a line of sight study. Um, we, this is a pedestrian crash in a home improvement store parking lot. So in this case, a pedestrian exits the store. Uh, they've been crossing the road and walking towards their vehicle parked in the first aisle. Uh, on the entrance road, a van comes in and approaches the stop sign. Uh, they roll through the stop sign, make a left turn, and continuing, they continue their left turn uh, in order to go into the first aisle as well, looking for parking. Uh, defense uh, expert claims that the van driver's view was blocked by the vehicle's A pillar. Now, in general, A pillars, if you don't know what the A pillar is, this is the, the piece of metal that is between the windshield and the side window. It's kind of in the location of the side view mirror. Um, obviously, this pillar can create an impediment to the vision of the driver. However, Again, proper driving techniques, uh, this, this is overcome by a driver moving their head, turning their head. Um, we, we generally don't consider this to be uh, a true vision impediment. However, uh, in this case, the attorney and the expert decided that they did want to go ahead with a line of sight study using a static head position and um, try to, trying to determine what impediment would have been created by the A-pillar in order to directly rebut the fences claim in this case. Next slide, please, Jesse. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, again, we started with the reconstruction. In this case, we had two uh, surveillance camera videos uh, from cameras positioned on the building, uh, one camera directly above the store entrance and one about 30 feet off to the side. Using these uh, two videos, we were able to determine the position of the van and the pedestrian at various points in time. Um, site geometry came from Google Earth and engineering blueprints that were provided during discovery. Uh, the van geometry came from blueprints that we were able to obtain online, along with uh, an uh, inspection of an exemplar vehicle. And then uh, the driver's seating and head position for the given size driver was also completed using the exemplar vehicle that we had. Now, Marcus, we, we had a, a quick question that came in here yep, uh, asking about the use of security cam footage to determine or assess um, line of sight investigations. And I, I think what you mentioned here is, is one example of how that's done, right? Where you were able to use security footage here to, to place the vehicle and pedestrian at different places in time. Uh, is there another way that, that you would use security footage on uh, in the course of these investigations? Yeah, so, you know, again, we have to be careful on how we use video footage. There's a lot of specialty tools and analysis software that we have to ensure that frame rates uh, are indeed what we think they are. So the timing is correct uh, to ensure that the video image um, and resolution is what we believe it to be, that we don't have missed frames, that type of thing. 
Um, but yeah, uh, oftentimes the, the surveillance footage is, is key in determining positions, but we have a lot of other techniques as well, uh, traditional reconstruction techniques that can be used. And of course, you know, oftentimes we rely on uh, testimony, witness statements, and police reports as well in order to reconstruct the events and, and you know, determine those positions in time. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question, I hope? It, it does. And yeah, sorry, I, I jumped ahead to the next slide. Oh, it was no, an, an errant book. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. So um, here we see uh, for this case, this is uh, just a view of the site. Uh, we can see the Google Earth imagery, which is the colored photograph, uh, which is a little smaller uh, with the engineering blueprint overlaid. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the discrepancy between the two was less than uh, an inch or two. Um, so very, very accurate and, and very consistent between the engineering blueprints and the as-built and photographed uh, site. A uh, few things uh, in blue, circled in blue, are were the positions of the two cameras. A uh, small green circle represented a tree, which was used as a marker. And then the two yellow circles represented lamp poles that were also used during the uh, video analysis to determine positioning uh, of the van. Uh, so this is our basic layout. So again, we had enough information uh, to get our layout. Uh, we were very confident in the accuracy of the layout, given the consistency between our two sources. Uh, and then from here, we began positioning uh, the van uh, with its sight triangles and, and the pedestrian at various points in time. Uh, if you don't mind, next slide, Jesse. So uh, this is at T negative eight seconds. Um, in this particular study, T equals zero did not represent the impact, uh, however, represented the point in time which the van came to a stop. Uh, impact with the pedestrian actually occurred uh, between negative two and negative one second uh, in this study. So we can see here the, the van is approaching the stop bar. Uh, the green triangles represent the uh, view that the driver has through the side windows and through the windshield. And then the two triangles in between the three green would represent the area that is being obstructed by the A pillar. And again, this is with a stationary head position. Um, but again, this was what the what the attorney and what the expert requested and, and what they wanted to use in their analysis. Uh, the pedestrian is a little difficult to see due to scale, uh, but I have an arrow pointing. Uh, at this point, the pedestrian is has exited the building. Uh, they're approaching the road, but they're not quite uh, into the crosswalk yet. They're still on the sidewalk. We can see that the pedestrian is uh, within a viewable area to the driver. And we will uh, forward here through time. Jesse, you can go to the next slide. So T negative seven, again, the pedestrian is now in the roadway. Uh, they are in the area of the crosswalk. Uh, again, the van is uh, roughly at the stop bar. And again, the pedestrian is still well within the driver's view and not being obstructed by the A-pillar. We'll move forward one. So we'll continue uh, along this. The van has begun its left turn. Uh, the pedestrian is still in the yellow hatching area of the roadway, uh, but again, still visible to the driver. Uh, at this point, uh, the pedestrian is out in the uh, right travel lane. Uh, they're beyond the cross hatching. Uh, the van is again within its left turn and still, although approaching the A-pillar, is still visible uh, in, in the driver's view. So now uh, we have reached a position um, where we do see as the uh, pedestrian approaches the middle of the road, and the driver's about midway through their initial left turn. We do approach an area where the pedestrian is uh, being blocked by the A-pillar, again, with a stationary head position um, for about a second and a half to two seconds. So we can see here at negative three seconds, uh, the pedestrian is just on the edge of that and, and about to come back into the driver's view through the windshield. Um, and we can see here in this next position, again, hard to see, but the driver or uh, the pedestrian would be visible to the driver. This is just prior to impact uh, through the front windshield. Um, however, at this point, the driver still did not see the pedestrian and, and continued for two more seconds um, running over the pedestrian with their front tire, uh, leading to a fatality, unfortunately, in this case. Um, so if you wanna go through that, you can see uh, you know, the, the points in time uh, put together, almost create a, a bit of an animation showing uh, that although the pedestrian would have been blocked by the A-pillar uh, for uh, a second or two, that overall in the, in the sequence that the pedestrian was visible to the driver and should have been visible 
um, at a point where the driver would have known uh, that they had to watch for pedestrian in their path. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so with that, we'll move on to case study number two. Uh, this one has some similarities. Again, a uh, pedestrian in a strip mall. They're crossing the road uh, to their, their vehicle, which is parked, uh, again, we were unsure of the exact location, but testimony put it in either aisle two or three. Um, there's an SUV exiting the aisle. Um, again, it's either aisle two or three based on testimony, uh, and they're making a left turn. Uh, in this case, uh, we were defense for the snow removal company. Um, the plaintiff claimed that the snow piles uh, that were created around the end caps for each aisle uh, impeded the sight triangles um, and blocked the driver's view and is what led to the uh, alleged impact. Um, in this case, the SUV did come to a stop, uh, but plaintiff claims that uh, during the course of this incident, she threw her arms out forward uh, and that there was contact between her uh, fingers and the front of the vehicle causing uh, injury to her hand. Um, in this case, uh, the uh, plaintiff expert uh, claimed that the sight triangles uh, were the issue, however, did no, no actual analysis to quantify how the sight triangles were affected uh, by the snow and whether or not they were actually causative. So uh, again, in this case, we started out with our reconstruction. Uh, in this case, we had no video, so we based our reconstruction on testimony, both from the plaintiff and the defendant, uh, and from the police report, uh, which indicated um, uh, positions of the, of the vehicle and pedestrian. Uh, in this case, the site geometry came from Google Earth and photographs that were taken by the plaintiff uh, a few days after the incident. Uh, and our geometry for the vehicle came from a program called AutoStats. Uh, this is a program used by a lot of law enforcement agencies. Uh, we also use this here at Robson as a uh, kind of an authoritative um, source for automotive type geometry, sizing, um, performance, that type of thing. So uh, again, this, this lays the foundation for our study in this case. And uh, with that, Jesse, if you can go on, mm -hmm. uh, I'll show the layout. Again, this, this, this study was a little different in that we had four different potential scenarios uh, based on the testimony in this case. Um, scenario one and two uh, has the SUV exiting aisle two. Um, depending on which version of testimony um, you're to believe, the impact either happened near the middle of the street uh, as the vehicle was in, in the middle of its turn or happened um, with the vehicle uh, having just completed its turn and heading straight on the, in the right lane uh, with the pedestrian about halfway through that travel lane. Uh, again, the two scenarios are the same except uh, the potential that they occurred in aisle three. Uh, so again, in order to be conservative and, and cover all possibilities, we, we did a line of sight study for all four scenarios. Uh, and as you can see in white, um, white gives you, in this case, this is just a, uh, um, an idea of the area of the snow banks. Um, once we look at the CAD, we'll see a, a more accurate representation of the, the snow bank geometry during uh, or at the time. Um, so this is, uh, this is the line of sight study for scenario one. Now here we can see the snow banks uh, in white. Uh, the geometry here is very conservative. Uh, this is based on photographs that were taken days after the incident and testimony. Um, conservative in that we, we made the snow banks about as large as possible uh, in order to just allow for a car to exit the aisle. Uh, and based on the photographs and testimony, we did still have a clear uh, left lane uh, for the through lane. Um, and again, the, this model basically is assuming that these snow banks are sheer walls uh, of inf infinite height, um, which again was not the actual case. But again, um, as defense, we wanted to make sure we had a worst case scenario um, uh, in doing our analysis here. So the blue again, in this case, the blue shaded triangle represents the field of view for the driver. Uh, and again, that's being limited by the snow banks. The small, uh, greenish pie wedge represents the area in which the pedestrian um, would be. So uh, at the point of the wedge would be uh, where the pedestrian was at impact. And then as we move away from that point, uh, that's the area the pedestrian may have been in while approaching area of impact um, 
starting at the point where the vehicle um, begins to pull out and make its left turn. Now, Marcus, of, of note mm -hmm. here is that we're not making any special accommodations for blind spots caused by the A-pillar, right? Because that, that is correct. In general, we do not consider the A-pillar to be a visual impediment. Um, again, in that prior case study, that was a special case where we were directly rebutting a very specific claim being made by the defense. Um, so in, in this study, we can clearly see that scenario one, um, the pedestrian is well within the view of the driver, um, even with the snow banks in place. Uh, again, we were, we were not arguing that without the snow banks that the blue triangle wouldn't be larger. It would, of course, but again, uh, we're looking to see whether or not it was actually causative and whether the, uh, the change to the site triangle would have caused uh, uh, an impediment to the view of, of the pedestrian. And again, in scenario one, that was not the case. There was no impediment due to the snow. So moving on to scenario two, uh, again, very similar setup, uh, slightly larger green pie uh, piece now based on the testimony um, for scenario two. Uh, the pedestrian may have been coming from uh, the area of the front of the store, or she may have been crossing uh, perpendicular to the road, again, depending on uh, the version of testimony. Uh, in this case, we can see that there is a very small portion of the pie piece to the left uh, that falls just outside of the driver's field of view. Um, but again, keep in mind, this is the driver's field of view as they just begin to pull out of the aisle. Um, the driver still has to make their way through their left turn and, and down the street. So the question became, how far does the driver need to pull out before the pedestrian does become uh, discernible, uh, at least as far as line of sight is concerned. And there was testimony that the driver was inching out slowly um, and looking and did not just pull out. So the next slide uh, takes a look at how far would the car have to pull out in order for uh, the pedestrian to be uh, viewable in any position um, in that pie wedge. And the answer is less than one inch. So you can see if you can flip back and forth between those two slides, Jesse, mm -hmm. you can see that the vehicle only moves forward. I think it's about uh, three quarters of an inch and that three quarters of an inch was enough to uh, bring the the pedestrian completely into the field of view of the driver so again in this case you know the line of sight study and i'm not going to go through scenario three and four they're they're basically the same scenarios just played out one aisle over um, but again this study was able to show that you know although there may have been a, a small change to the sight triangle that they were not causative in this case uh, and again, led to uh, led to us being able to argue that, um, you know, although the snow banks may have been improper, that they were not causative in this particular case. Right. So, Marcus, this was kind of the best case scenario where even with these these very conservative circumstances, the ice banks as big as they could be in order for the car to fit through and then treating them as sheer walls, you've got a tremendous amount of time here. Um, before which that that pedestrian was visible before impact would have occurred right absolutely yeah yeah so you know again um although my case studies were were automotive focused uh you know and again that's my background uh these types of studies can be applied to you know numerous different types of of cases um again we talked about uh, assailants um security guard field of view or security system angles of view. Um, I have been involved in cases with signage and vegetation obstructions. Um, they can be applied to construction site mishaps, marine incidents, um, objects or other animals in the roadway, uh, or even railroad crossings. In fact, uh, I was involved in a line of sight study for a very large uh, railroad crossing case where, where a vehicle was T-boned, uh, another fatal, unfortunately. Um, and there was a question of vegetation and uh, whether or not the vegetation or the improper trimming of the vegetation may have contributed to uh, the driver's inability to see the oncoming train. So again, uh, a lot of different scenarios this, this can be applied to, a lot of different cases that this can be uh, uh, an advantage um, to, to do one of these studies. And I think that's, uh, that's all we have for you. Um, if there are any questions? Uh, there are, Marcus, we, we had quite a few questions. And, and so- okay. Uh, first question we had was from Cleo, who was asking if we're going to show any any 3D samples coming up as well. And, you know, based on the amount of time that we had, we only included these these 2D examples. 
Um, but Marcus, how, how does the process change if the end deliverable is a, a 3D model of that line of sight for you? Yeah, I'll be honest, we do very, very little three-dimensional line of sight studies. Again, the vast majority can be answered uh, two-dimensionally. Uh, it also makes it you know, a lot easier to understand looking at a two-dimensional diagram versus uh, three-dimensional. Um, we do have some tools for that um, to do three-dimensional, and we have done some of those studies. Uh, and I believe we've actually done some A-pillar studies with three-dimensional uh, models as well to look at that. But uh, I do not have any examples of that. And, and again, in general, I would say 95% of the studies we do line of sight tend to be two-dimensional. Mm -hmm. Right. From, from a cost standpoint, the, the demonstrations that we showed here today in terms of the, the amount of time and investment to, to provide that to get the answer is, is much less than would be required for a 3D example. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, wonderful. So, Marcus, we had some other questions about the uh, the use of, of video. And so Dan was asking about the the reliability of surveillance videos and then whether or not some recordings speed up or slow down the action as the way that you would perceive it. Uh, that might make things look faster or slower than than they actually occurred in in real time. That, that's absolutely correct. So again, video analysis, uh, we need to be very careful when we analyze video. Uh, we do have some specialty software here where we can drill down into the video itself, including proprietary video formats. Uh, we can take a look to ensure that we indeed have uh, a, a constant frame rate. In some cases, we have a variable frame rate. Uh, that software allows us to look at frame by frame. It allows us to look at uh, our best effort timestamp for each one of those frames. Uh, to help us make the determination, was there a skip? Do we have uh, do we have five frames at one frame rate, and then suddenly we have a long pause before the next frame comes? Um, did the player potentially drop a frame, or you know, are we oversampled and have multiple frames of the same uh, of the same image? So, yeah, we 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 do have to be very careful um, because that can happen. And and simply just playing a video on on your Windows Media Player. And looking at the metadata and assuming that you know what the frame rate is uh, can get you into a lot of trouble. And, and we do have tools to drill down deeper than that. Um, but again, with, with, with video, there is always some, some potential that um, there's some variation. And we have some other techniques we use in order to uh, determine how much variation we may have and, and ensure that that variation isn't uh, affecting our analysis. Great. Um... Uh, Marcus, this next question is it's related to line of sight or at least visibility, but but the question was was pertaining to the angle of the sun and whether or not this can be recreated in accident reconstruction to understand how that may have affected visibility uh, for for the the folks in the incident. Yes, yeah, so that's an excellent question. So again, that that goes to my um, line of sight. Uh, only determines if you have an unobstructed view. There could be other factors, um, and, and sun glare can be one of those factors. Uh, we do have software that we use to determine uh, the position and angle of the sun uh, on the date and time of the incident. Uh, and depending if we start getting into lower angles, um, oftentimes we look at angles of uh, 15 degrees or less as being potential issues for sun glare. Uh, at that point, we may need to get a human factors expert involved uh, to start looking at glare issues and, and those types of things to see if there was uh, an issue. Um, generally, if the sun's higher in the sky and, and make that determination, then you know, oftentimes that is not really a, a factor in our analysis. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Marcus, for anybody who's on the line who might ha be involved in a case where line of sight is an issue, what's what is the most basic advice to give them? Is it to to get to the scene as as shortly after the incident occurred, and and take a lot of photos from the perspectives of the the people involved in the incident. Um, what do you suggest? Um, yeah, that depends. So if there is something uh, about that particular site that that may change, if it's a question of vegetation, um, and you think that vegetation may change, that someone may come and prune it, or if you're or, you know getting close to losing leaves uh, if it's you know early fall and, and if you get there too late now the leaves are gone the foliage is gone yeah i mean preserving 
preserving the evidence by taking photos or, or getting out there and surveying the scene uh, can definitely be uh, important depending on, you know, again, whether the uh, the obstruction is something that you think may change or, you know, if the obstruction is something that, that isn't going to likely change, then it may not be as, uh, as important. But yeah, obviously, again, having an accurate representation of the of the uh, scene uh, or, or the site, you know, as it was at the day of the incident is very important to these, mm -hmm. these studies. Right. But all is not lost if we don't have that, right? Because I, I know we've been involved in cases where we've had um, uh, uh, one of our arborists provide an opinion on growth rates of that tree, right? So maybe we have a photo uh, that depicted that, that scene in spring and we need to know what that would look like in summer or early fall there there are ways that we can um that we can predict what what that growth would be based on on seasonality and the species of of um whatever the vegetation was uh how how frequently marcus are you able to rely on those backdated google street views to understand what conditions were at at different times um, you know, it depends. Uh, I will say we do have some studies uh, done on Google Street View and, and Google Earth imagery, uh, showing it to be very accurate. Um, I've also done uh, a lot of studies relying on my own survey of the scene, whether it be total station or laser scan overlaid with Google. Uh, and I can tell you that the Google imagery uh, does tend to be very accurate and very reliable. Uh, the real question comes in, uh, when, when were the images taken? Uh, there are a lot of images that show up on Google Earth, some of higher quality from a resolution standpoint, some of lower quality. Um, so it's a matter of did they take a high quality image uh, near the time of the incident or not? Um, and that's you know something I can't really answer without knowing the exact area and taking a look to see what information is available. So I'd say it's a bit hit or miss, Jesse, with the Google, uh, whether or not you're going to get a good image or not for that time frame. Gotcha. Um, so, Marcus, if we have anybody on the line who's already working with an expert to do the crash reconstruction, uh, are they can they still contact you for the line of sight study or other aspects if if you're not otherwise engaged on the case? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, technical services here at Robson, uh, we can either work with an existing Robson expert. Uh, so if you've already retained an expert, um, that expert can reach out. And, and we can work directly with them uh, in order to do these types of studies. Um, but we also work directly with attorneys. Um, so even if you don't have a Robson expert um, retained, um, we can still provide uh, technical services. Um, we can work with other experts. We can work with you directly uh, in order to uh, produce these types of studies or to provide other services. Um, at, at Robson Technical Services, we offer uh, laser scanning, uh, aerial drone uh, photography, um, 3D printing, demonstrative creation, um, CAD work, uh, the list goes on. We have a lot of, lot of services we offer here uh, that can, again, either be uh, offered directly to uh, a retained Robson expert or, or directly to you or one of your experts as well. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, okay. Well, Marcus, I think that brings us to the end of the questions and the end of today's program. We, we hope that it was helpful for everybody on the line, and we hope that you join us again for a future program. Um, thank you, Marcus. All right. Thank you, guys.